notion of knife cuts and something like that and things like that. So um, I think we're going to get started here. I know that we have more people joining as we um, as we go on. I am going to mute everybody for the time being, but please feel free to leave notes in the chat, which is located on my on my right. I don't know where it shows up on your screen, but please feel free to ask questions, leave us notes there and things like that. And um, we will come to them at the end and make sure that everybody um, is, um, everybody's answered is the word I was looking for. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so firstly, thank you all so much for joining us um, this afternoon slash evening. Um, it is my great pleasure to sit down with Ryan Schutte, our photographer, um, who does real incredible stage photography um, on a really massive scale that um, is, is kind of hard to tell from um, a digital representation that we're going to do here. But um, we have a lot of things to look at. And I think it's going to be great. So um, firstly, or secondly, rather, because I said firstly, thank you, guests. Secondly, thank you, Ryan. Um, it's so nice to sit down with you. Thank you. Happy to be here. Um, what I'd like to do is share my screen with everyone so that you can see some uh, examples of Ryan's work. And we're going to talk a little bit about them. And we will um, basically just go through um, some really cool pieces and, and go through um, all of that stuff. So I'm going to share my screen in a moment. I just have to find it. Here we go. So we are going to start now with um, not this piece. This is like the end of the show. I'm so sorry. I just totally ruined this. Spoiler alert, everyone. Don't look, don't look. OK. <laughs> um, we're going to get started with, um, in the spirit of it being mid-October, it's OK, Linda, you can come back now. With the spirit of it being early October um, and you know the start of everybody's favorite my favorite season, everybody's favorite spooky season, we are going to kick things off um, with Halloween. And here's your first image to look at. But firstly, Ryan, would you please be so kind to tell us a little bit about yourself? How'd you get your start? I understand you were born right outside of Chicago, which is really cool. I'm a Chicago girl myself. So, um, you know, we have we have much hometown love. But uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. How would you how would you describe how you got your start, what you're doing? And um, all of the stuff that uh, you do now. Uh, yeah, after leaving, you know, Chicago Midwest area so in around uh, 1997 to go to college on the West Coast. Uh, I was originally going for business and started taking a bunch of studio arts classes and landed on photography and kind of switched my whole trajectory and ended up at art school at the San Francisco Art Institute. So from there, uh, I moved down to San Diego, worked mm -hmm. for a magazine for a couple of years, and ended up in LA kind of on a whim and started assisting commercial photographers. Uh, and from there, I was working at a rental house. And that's kind of when these big stage narrative scenes developed uh, because I had access to all this equipment that I could just take advantage of. And so as much as possible, I started building these scenes without knowing why or where they're going. Um, I was just really inspired by the architecture and the landscape in LA. It's just, you know, I, before living there, I actually really hated it. I thought it was an ugly city and I didn't see any reason to want to move there except for needing to get work. And then as I got settled in, I started to really appreciate a lot of the history that gets overlooked here. I mean, you know, history for LA, not necessarily in the grand scheme of Americana, but uh, it has its own thing for sure. This particular image, uh, you know, is kind of part of the oldest things that LA has to offer. So it's an interesting museum slash row of historic houses that are collected from all across the city and brought to this one area to form this kind of, uh, you know, their original houses that were built in the city, but they were collected and shipped over to this one specific neighborhood. Uh, oh, that's super cool. I had no idea. 
Yeah, it's called Heritage Square Museum. It's an amazing place. Uh, it's actually now right down the street from where I'm living, so I could walk there. Um, and yeah, I, it's, I just- It's got, an amazing building. Look at this. There's so much to look at. Yeah, it's, it's to me, it's mind boggling because it looks like, uh, you know, obviously it was restored, but it looks like it was created to emulate something of that era, but it was, I think, built around the time what, that it looks like, you know, so- uh and there's a whole there's probably i think 10 of them there but you know there's That's other so little cool. pockets within la that have architecture similar to that yeah um for those of us who are i mean i know certainly it's my job to know but for those of us who don't know can you explain a little bit what stage photography is yeah so just kind of coming up with a story uh, and wanting to tell, in this instance, and in a lot of the larger scenes, it's multiple stories all kind of happening at once. So it's very heavily directed. We cast actors to play particular roles. They know coming in uh, exactly what they're gonna be doing uh, to, to some extent. Uh, you know, we have a starting point, uh, which always kind of shifts as we, shoot but the idea is that uh, each scene is telling this story and how do we accomplish with all these little details and props and wardrobe and lighting to kind of tell this overly dramatic story uh, in one frame and so this particular story is just a classic trick-or-treat scene kind of turned on its head and, you know it's a bit over the top a lot over the top i should say and uh <laughs> You know, even though these houses are very heavily art directed in themselves, you know, we're adding all the Halloween accoutrement, the spider webs, and kind of this dappled light to give it that eerie vibe. And then all the costumes, we, you know, we had a wardrobe stylist come in and help with all that. And it was a big production to get this one image. So, typically, how long does a shoot like this take? A whole day? Yeah, I mean, I do have multiple days, and that's almost never happened. But the, the best case scenario would be you'd come in the day before just to stage everything and, and do a light test because most of these are shot during golden hour or twilight. And so they have really only 10 minutes where the light's perfect. Uh, and to try and get everyone to do the right thing in that short time frame is really challenging. So uh, but, you know, on average, if I had to generalize, we maybe shoot for one to two hours each time and then kind of take a collection of our best frames for each character and put them together. But, you know, oh, okay. they've so there's manipulation in, in more ways than one. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, they have happened in one shot and the goal is always to get it in one frame. Like we direct and light everything so it looks in camera, pretty much the way you see it here, uh, there isn't a ton of post work that changes what was actually there uh, while you're standing there. But, uh, it, you know, just to, because there's so many people trying to get them all to do the same thing in this split second where there's like a burst of action uh, becomes yeah. a little challenge. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I really love about your work, um, this image is such a good example of it. Um, and then the following that we'll talk about really briefly um, is the way that you light them, the way that every, I mean, aside from, I mean, every photographer considers lighting, every photographer has to consider what light is going to make their image look like and how it's going to influence what imagery they're able to do. But I think it's really interesting the way that you have very clear stage lighting down here in this kind of dappled area. And then you have this piece over here where Rapunzel is highlighted in this lighting and this little dude is highlighted in his own area. And then the, I think equally interesting are the areas that you choose not to light. So you have this very ominous figure hiding in the back here who is coming to take this little girl. I don't know, but I mean, he's, he's very much hidden in the shadows. And so the use of light and shadow here um, is, is so dynamic and also highlighting these characters in the front with with headlights is such an interesting choice. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what kind of lighting considerations you can, and then obviously here's this, I think she's like a, a, it's like a widow's walk and she's sort of like a witchy lady dreaming about 
I don't know. Yeah, she was overseeing the neighborhood, uh, kind of the Cruella de Vil character back there. Oh, for sure, for sure. But, uh, you know, I, this scene was a challenge because it is so broad in scope and I, I really wanted it to be ominous in the way Halloween should be, but I also wanted you be, to be able to see everything. And, and that's kind of a, a big difference between motion and uh, stills when you print this image six feet wide, if you make it too moody, you're losing those details uh, in the shadow. So Absolutely. I think if this were a moving image, this would be a little bit too obvious and too bright uh, to give that spooky Halloween vibe. But uh, the dapple was the best attempt to kind of split the difference. So it's still bright in the sense that it's going to pop off uh, even a computer screen. Uh, but you know, you have these dappled shadows, which are created through multiple sources that have kind of like uh, mini tree branches projected in front of them. And so the two main areas in front are two projections of that dappled light. And then the dapple on the house itself is actually just a light going through the tree. So if there was a tree in front of the whole scene, I could have just shot like here. The tree. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. So ideally, you would just have trees there to do, to create that. But if you don't, it's really convenient to have these uh, little projection boxes that uh, can mimic that dappled tree branch look. So That's there's perfect. a lot going on there. Yeah. To get all the Thank windows you. glowing in the house, you have, you know, we spend all day kind of fine tuning all the power ratios of all those lights. And it's a super big challenge because you're testing during the day when you don't know what it's going to look like at night. And so right. you're doing your best guess. And as you do more and more of them, you get a better sense of what's going to change. But, you know, it still comes down to that 10 minutes when the light's perfect and you got to have assistance to be able to go sprint to every light and adjust the power and make sure it looks right. So uh, there's a lot of considerations with the lighting to get it just right. It works here. Um... And then on like a completely different side of the lighting spectrum, you have this image here, um, which uh, in the, as the Halloween image feels super, super broad. Um, I think that you really kind of masterfully contain the space of this one. Staging and all of that obviously plays into it, but the fact that it feels so claustrophobic and the way that you have the lighting in so many different sources, which I think is probably a really neat, I used to use the word neat, um, <laughs> you have organic sources of light. We expect light to come from a lamp. We expect light to come from a television screen or from a fire. And um, I love the way that you've used the light here. I mean, there's a world going on outside her window. You can tell it's a bright sunny day, but here she is, she's trapped inside with a roaring fire and um, and she's so lost. So um, the, the way that you can really manipulate, manipulate your lighting to talk about those two different extremes is is one of the I think it's almost a character in and of itself in your work. Yeah, and like you said, being in this uh, much smaller environment creates its own challenge because you want to highlight these specific areas, especially with a scene this busy. But uh, light can very easily start to bounce all over the place and 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 kind of flatten everything, especially when you're adding. In this instance, there's haze in the air, so that diffuses the light and, and tends to flatten things out. Uh, so with this many sources, you know, there's only almost as many sources in this image as there was in that massive outdoor scene. So, right. uh, but you just are kind of manipulating them in different ways. And again, this looks pretty much like this uh, out in the camera, but I'm also going in and post and kind of masking little areas and, and making some areas darker and some lighter to really control that specifically. So I think the light on her eyes was pretty close to that, but the, the fact that it's just kind of cutting across her eyes and then falls off on her face, it was a specific choice to say, let's highlight the kind of forlorn look in her eyes. And then if there's any particular props that I wanted to highlight and that got too dark just because we can't put little spotlights in every little thing, then you can go right. in and 
and brighten things uh, accordingly. But yeah, this was fun because in the same day, we were telling the story of a hoarder. And it was a story in Psychology Today magazine about hoarding. So this was like this, the baseline uh, craziness where it started. And then we went through all the stages of her cleaning it up into the final shot where it was totally just neat. And she was kind of happy that she had, you know, Marie Kondo her way into <laughs> uh, so she got rid she of all She is one of the, well, I don't want to say tidy or neat, but I was going to say one of the most organized hoarders I've ever seen. I <laughs> love the section of teacups and the section of books, the section of cameras and all these creepy dolls. And over here you have your nice little teddy bear corner. So I really appreciate the way that this is put together. And I really appreciate the way that you um, play this angel's face, this very <laughs> benevolent little presence here off of her yeah. face. There's such a great contrast between the two of them. Yeah, and that could have been an accident. It could have been <laughs> the work of uh, my brother, Collins, who art directed this scene and you know, very much made those little pockets uh, intentionally on his end. And I don't even know that we had a discussion before then about that. And that's just his kind of genius in making that happen. And so he's looking through the monitor, seeing where I'm gonna place her. And then he's making adjustments on the fly, running back and forth to all the little prop stations and, and kind of highlighting things as he sees where the light falls as well. So this was very much a team effort in order to get this effect. Uh -oh. Throwing it up again. Um, I just think that the way that you have really highlighted the drama of this moment, the drama in her face, this, this expression that is so sad. I mean, a lot of people with mental illness, um, they, they hide it. They hide it from the world. They hide it from uh, everybody else. And a lot of people don't even know that someone is dealing with mental illness. And so something like hoarding has a connotation that is very, very negative. Um, why can't you help yourself? Why can't you clean up? Why can't you fix this? You know, what's wrong with you kind of thing. And so I love the way that we have been invited to spy on this really dramatic moment. She's coming to some sort of realization. She's like, oh God, how do I keep living like this? And um, we're really privy in a very voyeuristic way to that realization. And so I think that's one of those really cinematic moments that you've been describing and it's so um she's just so sad but i'm glad yeah. that you mentioned that she gets it together in, you know towards the end <laughs> of, of your series here yeah and that's another one that's uh you know we never printed this one for bg and i would love to see this image really big because even zooming in at this size on the computer I don't know if you can see it. Can you uh, go down to a coffee cup? I think there was a trail of liquid falling, but maybe it's just not going to be. Yeah, you know, it it might have eventually not made the cut because some of those things, like the milk, really worked in the other scene because it was in Halloween, it, right? It caught the light, and I think it was like coffee spilling out of her mug, and it just blended too much, so we ended up taking it out. But like. There's details like that, that seeing this six feet wide would really be amazing in a gallery. Um, I think, well, it would be a little bit like, um, I'm a child of the late 80s, early 90s, and something that we used a lot in road trips and stuff like that, and times when children needed to be distracted and um, entertained, like any, like children now are given screens, they're given iPads or yeah. phones or something like that. I was given, um, a book called I Spy, where I was supposed to find the little, like the pencil in this crazy busy image um, or a football in an image that is just packed to the brim with a hundred thousand different things going on. And I think that you have a really similar kind of thing here, um, but there's an element of surprise because you don't know what you're looking for. So, you know, you come across this, um, you come across Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young down here, and um, I love this album, so that's a cool find for me. Or you come over here and you see what looks like a majorette um, mm -hmm. jacket or something like that. So there are all of these little pieces that become really personal. You're like, oh my God, I love that album, or I was in band, or something like that, that really become part of the story for everybody else. So the details are, are 
so, so important and, and such a cool, and it, yes, if you saw it six feet wide, I mean, I, you could spend all day looking at it. I can spend all day looking at artwork, period. But um, <laughs> for those who are not similarly minded. It's funny you brought up that majorette jacket. I never thought about it, but that same jacket was used on the cover of the book of the person, the band guy getting thrown in the pool. So that's, <laughs> and that <laughs> Cosby Stills album was shot by Henry Dill, who's been to the studio where we pulled all these props from. So I never even put that together till now. Uh, that's a, another little bit of LA trivia. He's still shooting photos and uh, good old Henry. I don't know if you know the Morrison Hotel stuff, but he's done all that old band stuff from the 60s and 70s. Right. Yeah. No, it's, it's such a cool detail. Um, the next one of another really, and I don't want to like be like next on our list. And um, yeah. another really important aspect of your artwork as we as we move on from lighting and into staging choices and things like that is the way that I find it. I am an art historian by training. I went um, and got a degree in art history, and for a long time, I thought that I was going to be a Renaissance scholar. Um, then I went and spent time abroad in Florence, and after four months. Um, of looking at nothing but like Renaissance fresco and and things like that decided that I really need something I needed something that wasn't so stagnant so I went into contemporary artwork um, however it's very much how I understand artwork now um, because in the in the Renaissance we see the first usage of, of symbols that are really they're they're put into play in a way to uh, advance the story in a way to tell a story um, so if you see a symbol that if you see a lily in a, a Renaissance painting, you can be sure that the lily refers to maybe a beautiful flower, but also to the Virgin Mary because it was a symbol of her. Mm -hmm. If you see um, a, an empty jug sitting on a table, it also refers to the Virgin Mary in a way because she was an empty vessel to receive God's blessings. So, um, this was used because um, a lot of people in the Renaissance didn't read. So this is how they understood the world around them. This is how they learned about the Bible and things like that. And um, so when I look at your work, I see a lot of things that are referential to that history. I mean, art history, I, you can argue, is, is one, one movement responding to the next, responding to the next, and responding to the next. And so, and, and a lot of people argue these days that art history and art in general is about about stealing and appropriating so um and making it better so when i see this piece here um the ice cream man roy that we were talking about really briefly um i see a couple things that point to that renaissance aspect and and the one that i think is really spectacular is this huge patch of light shining down on top of our ice cream man's head who is this poor guy looks so i can't i can think of so many i mean he just looks so he looks a little bit terrified. He's super sad. I mean, he just looks completely wrecked. But here we have this beam of light that is shining down on him. And, and it reminds me a lot of this piece um, from the mid 1500s, I want to say, um, called The Expulsion from Eden. I'm not going to give you guys an art history lesson. But if you see this here, this mm -hmm. piece is a fresco in a chapel in Italy. And um, this black thing was actually gilded back when it was first painted in the 1500s, 1400s maybe, I'm not entirely sure. Um, and this beam of light, which was gilded, is representative of God's presence. Mm -hmm. And um, you see that here in this piece as well, which is a dove who is representative of God, but he is here informing Mary about his choice to have her conceive his child. And here you have more gold that is representative of his presence. And so when I go back and I look at your image, Ryan, and I see this beam of light here, it reminds me so much of that, um, of the way that you know, there's a biblical passage and I'm a Jew, so forgive me if I mess it up. Um, the meek shall inherit the earth. And here I see somebody who is so completely um, taken advantage of, but also protected by this benevolent light. It's such an interesting contrast for me. Um, and something that stands out immediately which a lot of people maybe don't see immediately but i can appreciate that a lot yeah and i think that's all spot on is to his actual feeling at the time because 
you know, we talked about it before, but uh, he was, you know, kind of assaulted earlier in the day by a hundred children who were, he was sitting on top of the ice cream truck and they were instructed by me to throw ice cream at him because we had, <laughs> oh, this, poor guy. We had this whole other uh, kind of photo in mind. And again, this is a collaboration with Chad Addy who uh, just had a sketch of a lonely ice cream man with wrappers around him. And it was a very simple, you know, uh, one line drawing that turned into, after we had many discussions, this whole other scene because you know, I always wanted to make a mess wherever I go. And I was like, well, what if we had 100 kids in there? And so we did, we cast 100 kids, we got an ice cream sponsor and we got them all that, you know, getting this huge long line. We did this Gulliver's Travels thing where they tied them up. And then, you know, there's this <laughs> massive shot of them all throwing their ice cream, which was a lot of fun. And again, on video, it worked better uh, visually, but, at the end of the day, this was the only thing that ever kind of saw, uh, the, the public saw, because this was the original intention. So after the daytime kind of left and all the kids went home, we got to focus on Roy and uh, he really brought it. You know, I, I remember him trembling as he was evoking this emotion. And, you know, he's a classically trained actor, so he was going for it. And I think that comes across, even though it's like, oh, for sure, you know, see the movement of him kind of traveling, but he really was scared. You know, he, he was taking in the trauma from earlier in that day and bringing oh, it. I mean, I think I probably would be too with a hundred kids running around <laughs> me, you know, high off of sugar and I <laughs> totally get it. It's not that much of a stretch. Yeah. Yeah. It was a, uh, it was a crazy shoot altogether, but yeah, as far as you not knowing, I mean, we had the sketch, we knew what we wanted to do, but at the end of the day, you know, we didn't know Roy was going to do that. Like we, we were going to try and get him close. I think the original sketch had him just kind of like looking down, but this kind of like just a little bit of eyeball we get to see into his uh, fear really took it to a whole new level, so. He looks like the tragedy mask. If you think of the two masks that represent comma and drama, you know, comedy mm -hmm. and drama, yeah. um, and you have this super exaggerated frowny face on the drama mask, that's exactly what I see here because the quality of the lighting also coming from above mm -hmm. has created these really deep and dark shadows that make his face almost mask-like. Yeah. Um, so there are like, I mean, again, there are 101 considerations going in here, but the finished product is I mean, his the emotion here, which is kind of hard for me to put my finger on, but I can feel it. I mean, I can't really speak it, but I can feel it is just stunning. And it's just such a such a cool way to have and you know to see your process born from a sketch or Chad's sketch rather, and yeah. then uh, you know made into this moment. It's just so cool. Um, I wanted to talk about the light in this one as well. Um, and talk about, again, Italian Renaissance. <laughs> Stop me if you've heard this before. Um, there are two major, um, two major painting principles in, in Italian Renaissance painting. One is called sfumato, which is something you can see in our Horner image really well, this very smoky, um, hazy atmosphere. And the other one is chiaroscuro, which is about the light and dark places in your painting, in your canvas and um, creating an image based off of what's actually not there. Um, so the lighting here is a completely different vehicle as you have this super cool moment of discovery. This little boy here is calling, I don't know what, a treasure, a, a buried treasure, a pearl, I'm not sure, out of a lake and his sister is completely wrapped. Um, and mom has no idea what's going on, but it's so similar here because your eye, aside from the fact that it's framed by this this really intimate mountain setting, your eye is drawn immediately to this point um, where, where he's pulling this crazy object out of the water. Um, is that something that you often think about? <laughs> Just uh, in case you think about Italian Renaissance painting? Um, you know, like you said, as far as people building off histories, I think we have gone so, far since then of this kind of 
going from one culture to another, I didn't study art history. I, I had no idea about the specifics of this whole, you know, tableau vivant uh, thing that was going on, not only in photography, but, you know, in sculpture, in theater, in painting, well, for hundreds of years. So it's not a specific kind of look that I was going for, but it, it just kind of naturally went there because I think a lot of the people I'm influenced by were already consciously uh, taking from that. So I, I like to point to much more basic uh, influences like 80s movies and gremlins, you know, like that type of thing on its such a simple level, seemingly uh, really is building off of the history of your So this, you know, the light thing, I mean, I didn't think of gremlins when I shot or created that little orb that was coming out of the water. But now that I'm thinking about it, it, it feels like a very gremlins type lighting scenario and just kind of the paranormal. So uh, it has that aspect of camp for sure. Yeah. Not like Absolutely. not camping, summer camping or anything like yeah. that, but camp um, in that. Um, what do you see when you when you seek to create an image like this? What does it look like to you on your end? Uh, I mean, I can kind of imagine, you know, when I see this location. So this particular location, uh, I knew I wanted a water feature in a place where we can take, this is my sister and her kids. I want to find a place we can take them to spend 4th of July and go camping. And so I found this farm up near Sequoia National Park. And just based off of a, a super simple, like bright daylight, shot of the pond, I was like, I know that I could create a scene here, which gives the mood that the rest of the series was hoping for. And I didn't know that that we were going to have this amazing uh, mountain line in the background, like that horizon just kind of was a very fortunate uh, accident that it all played together so well. And, that, you know, the whole pond is glowing because of the reflection. And then you see the horizon kind of cutting the pot in half perfectly yeah. around the boat. And that's the thing with these shots, like it's half a lot of careful planning and half a lot of very fortuitous things that you can't predict. So, uh, you know, it could have been overcast that day and we wouldn't have had that beautiful gradient in the sky, but all the props and all the planning with like painting that logo on the tent, uh, to perfectly match the bus that we drove up there. Those are all very intentional, uh, specific kind of color scheme and graphic design elements that are brought into this. But there's just so much going on that you don't you don't know what's going to happen. I mean, you, you have the pieces there to to put them together, but you better be ready to be sprinting back and forth again during that ten minutes when the light's perfect because you can. <laughs> You got to move the baby just to the right spot so they're underneath that light and you know it's like uh, get all the food on the table right it's it's kind of just as much fun as in that kind of adrenaline fueled moment of sprinting around as the end piece you know and sometimes the end piece doesn't work out and that's a bummer but it's the process is just as good. You know, you're, you're happy you had that experience either way. Right, yeah. Did you go into this planning to have him lift this glowing orb out of the water? Absolutely, and that stupid, I'm only gonna call it stupid because of how much pain it has caused me over the years. Uh, I, I built that thing out of plexiglass and a lot of glue for no good reason. I don't know, I was doing some really terrible sculpture experiment and I had spent so much time on it that I was like, I have to use this somewhere. How can I use it? I mean, up close, it's really ugly. I, I had like covered it in all this broken glass that was painted with all these different color paints. And I really wanted it to kind of emit this like rainbow, like kind of like a disco ball in reverse, uh, like from the inside out though. So that's why it's, it's glowing because it's backlit. Uh, by a strobe that 
makes it glow that way. But if you front light it and you don't see all the details blown out, it's just this terrible plexiglass sculpture. But, you know, I covered <laughs> it in this like actual fishing net that I got from the army surplus store. So it felt kind of like this authentic uh, orb. You know, in my mind, it, it had dropped from space and it had become this kind of glowing paranormal fixture that he fished out of the pond. So that's kind of a backstory that a lot of people don't get, but I want them to come up with their own story. But that's kind of where I was going with the idea of like why the rays were coming down and there's kind of little fireflies going around. Uh, and he's just supposed to be kind of beside himself as, as to what he caught. And that's why oh, he totally is. Look at his face. Oh, I don't <laughs> want to pixelate him too much, but look at his face. He's like a, you know, a, a six-year-old kid going, whoa, yeah. I can totally see it. <laughs> Good old, um, yeah. It's interesting that you mentioned that you think it should be a meteorite because it seems very, very, it seems like a very benevolent presence to me. It feels like, and maybe it has to do with the fact that it's, um, it's a bright white light, which yeah. In certain circumstances feels creepy but here um feels very much like he has just pulled this gigantic buried treasure out of and because it's, i think because it's also um dripping like glitter and sparkles and everything about it i mean you feel like you can hear the angels singing in the heavens everything's opening up and it's this incredible moment of um this precipice of action everything is going to change here and you have this incredible moment where it's just barely been captured and nobody's aware of it yet yeah I mean I would have loved to have kind of a video sequence of that thing lifting out of the water with like you know the seaweed and uh kind of yeah. water dripping from it but uh this is as close as we're going to get in a still image to that happening and and that thing's really hanging there so they're all actually looking at that it's it's really uh something I want people to understand that this not this, I don't kind of ever want to make this Photoshop mess where I'm just inserting nonsense into these frames. Like I want the people on set to have the experience that the viewer has at the end of the day. So he is pulling on this fishing pole and, and giving it that tension to make it look like he's really struggling. Obviously we had to have a a stand holding that thing up because it was this <laughs> very heavy object but like I, I had him lean into it and kind of pull on that rod to give it that bend so uh and you know the, his sister's out there on the boat by herself which she probably shouldn't be but it was a very shallow pond so we, we felt <laughs> but you know like she's like I'm getting bit by mosquitoes can I come in yet and it's like yeah okay <laughs> we got it we got it let's let's eat our fourth of July corn on the cup <laughs> Oh, that's great. I love that. Um, so do we get, do, what happens next? Do you know? Do we know? Do we get to know? In this sequence? Yeah. You mean after they pull the thing out or the next image? Yeah, when he, oh, after he pulls the thing out, what happens next? What comes next? I mean, ideally it would open up like cocoon and like out would float, uh, like you said, the benevolent uh, creature that would grant them all their wishes I don't know <laughs> that's that's for the viewer to really determine uh for themselves but they get this moment to just fixate on and and take in all the details of that particular climax okay I won't I won't ruin the, the <laughs> I won't spoil what comes next <laughs> um coming out of that one talking about lighting again talking about a really heroic moment is this great image of a friend of yours Paul Octavius um, this was shot in Chicago, and um, this cracks me up because in Chicago there is um, every city, every every area of the United States has kind of a local dialect, and um, in Chicago we have a lot of slang that people don't recognize or use. The same thing in New York. I mean, people don't recognize or use outside of that area, um, and this area reminds me a lot of this concept called the front room where in Chicago, there's this front room. It's a, it's a, a mashup of the word front room. Um, but the front room is where a mom like entertains all of her friends. And occasionally there are plastic slip covers and nobody plays in there, but it's this, and it usually has these bay windows that look out over the street, and it, but it's very proper. And, and I love the way that he's occupying the space. 
um, such a hallowed Chicago space. But can you tell us a little bit about this image? Yeah, so I was uh, going home to visit family and uh, I work with this online photo magazine called the Photographic Journal who interviews photographers and has photographers do uh, features for them, just kind of personal work that is fine art slash editorial based. And, you know, they wanted to interview Paul and I knew Paul at this point, probably for a few years already. And so I said, I'm already gonna be there. Let me interview him and shoot his portrait because Traditionally, the journal itself does a lot of uh, more kind of natural light, very straightforward uh, portraits. And uh, Paul had been on a lot of our food camp photos that I've made in the past where these, you know, conglomeration of 40 photographers get together for a weekend and go make photos together. And I always do a big group shot with everyone. So he kind of knew that, uh, campy approach I like to take and obviously he enjoys it as well because this is his front room with all of the props and everything's there you know styled the way that he likes it so the costume is his idea you know this is exactly how he wanted to be portrayed uh, and of course I was immediately in love with this amazing uh, heart costume that he had you know <laughs> it's all, amazing it really is yeah, the, the Black Bear uh, cutouts, I don't know where he got that. He told me the history of all the different props, but there are so many, like the cactus light uh, and everything just kind of, we kind of arranged it according to the frame to show the curvature of that turret structure again, that it was such an amazing room that he had and that light fixture. I don't know if that was there or he added that from an antique store or something, but you know, you could, dig into this one forever to really see the nuance of all the little props as well. Um, and, you know, we shot very quickly for how I'm used to working. You know, we probably did this in like an hour and because we oh, had wow. to go and we went to his little private Soho House club and did the interview. And so we had like a whole nother thing to accomplish, but uh, this was a lot of fun. And we knew the moment we, got this frame it was like okay we don't need to you know because normally you kind of keep trying different things forever but we're like all right we got it let's move on uh and we were both really happy with it so that's kind of the backstory he looks like such a hero um yeah. which i really think is is you mean a lot there's a lot of dynamic movement and positioning in um a lot of the images we've looked at but in this one, he, he's kind of, he's in his off kilter position, but he is really positioned like a sort of classic hero position. And, you know, he's almost as if he's like thrusting his chest out and his cave, his cape is waving behind him. It feels just <laughs> like that. Yeah. Um, and I love that his portrait has so much, um, so much levity to it. You know, traditionally portraiture is, when we think about portraiture, we think about, sitting in, um, you know, we think about school pictures and how you're supposed to smile a certain way, or you think about, um, you think about passport pictures and how you're not supposed to smile for them anymore, anything like that. And back in the day, portraiture was, was typically reserved for somebody who was either a hero, like George Washington or Louis XIV, um, somebody, or somebody really, really wealthy, like the patrons of a church after which a church was named or something like that because they could afford to spend the hours sitting taking this photograph or photograph or painting or whatever it is um and here with his baseball cap and his his tube socks I mean he really is just an everyman who's been elevated to the position of this super heroic super um important figure like you would get and I like to compare this to um an image I know that everybody has seen um, this is Gilbert Stewart's George Washington. And this is the kind of um, portraiture that I'm talking about. You know, George Washington, whoa, is a hero. And he, you know, he's positioned with all of the accoutrement of being a hero. He's got his little sword here. He's got his um, plume, which is, you know, about all the great writings he's done. And here, he, this talks about how he's such a great general. And so you have something that is so similar with Paul. <laughs> it's amazing. Who I is wonder, maybe 
if it's Paul a great is conquest. That, yeah, I, I, I got it. I have to show that to Paul and ask him if he's seen that because, you know, he did that with his hands and the sword mirroring the bow and arrow. You're right. It, I don't know how you put that together and, and found, but it's like the similarities are really uncanny. Yeah, it's it's the same. It's you know, and it's and I I think that's what's so important. You know, so special about this this image to me is that we have somebody. We have George Washington, the father of the nation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and you know, the moment that we're living in, it's it's especially um, prescient. But and here we have Paul, who is just hanging in the front room in his Cupid costume, and I think, <laughs> and I and I love the humor in that. So yeah. Um, I think we all take ourselves too seriously. Art history um, is a great tool to understand a lot of different things, but I also like to bring the levity to it. I like to bring humor and and things like that because it's important to enjoy, you know, to laugh at it at the same time. So I appreciate yeah. that that's what you've done here with Paul. And maybe he, you know, kind of needled you into it a little bit, but. Um, oh yeah, well, you know, you should check out the rest of his work because before he even really knew how to shoot photos, he was making these amazing, uh, it's, it's hard to explain, but he was shooting him in this living room, these photos of these clouds, and he's very known for these whimsical uh, silhouettes that he's making these same gestures with. And I didn't kind of put that together until just now that this is, you know, such a good mashup of uh, a, a wider scene, uh, the way that I would kind of approach a living room, and, and Paul's already in a nature to just give it that whimsy and make it this lighthearted, uh, humorous thing, which is amazing that he was, you know, ready to do that for his own portrait. So uh, I think I'm, really I'm just, just glad he has a Cupid costume. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I bet he still has it. <laughs> um, this is one of the, um, this is an image that I'm super, super fond of because I think it is just so stunningly beautiful. Um, but to further talk about being a hero and positioning your characters and your subjects in such a way that they are um, heroic and they're sort of like miniature portraits in and of themselves. You have this piece here, this dancer's piece. Um, everybody's involved in their own action, but particularly this figure in the front, she, she's standing there like she is a badass bitch and she looks it. And I love that in the compare, in the contrast with these women who are having such a great time at the piano and these two over here, come on. <laughs> these two over here who are having their own little interplay with whatever's happening there. Um, tell us a little bit about what went into this scene, please. So the woman who's uh, furthest, to, second to the left of the frame, who's kind of like referencing the hero and she's standing on the corner of the piano there yeah. Uh, I photographed her since she was five years old uh, and has been, no way. Of, yeah, since she was in one of the original uh, kind of large tableaus that I've done, actually two of them. Uh, and then over the course of the years, we stay in touch. Uh, and all of a sudden she's uh, in this dance troupe and she's in high school at the Los, An Los Angeles uh, County High School for Arts, and then this other dance troupe called the Debbie Allen Dance Academy. And she was kind of the maven that brought those two groups of dancers together when we kind of started talking like, how can we make a, a dance tableau? And so it, it came about just simply from that and, you know, from there, it's like, okay, let's get a location together. Who's going to be in it? What are we going to be doing? What does the place look like? And this was at a time when they were all graduating high school. And they're high know, schoolers? Yeah. So they had just got their prom dress. Oh, wow. They, I think it was either the month before or the month after prom. I can't remember, but they all had their dresses and were ready to go. So we also had a stylist wow. kind of uh, work with them to kind of pick whether we were going to use their actual prom dresses or whether we wanted to tailor it to something more specific to the decor of the location which is you know thankfully also a theater uh, it's the los angeles theater company 
uh, downtown, which was an old Art Deco bank. So there's all these kind of like elements going into what's shaping the end visual here. And the story itself was just, let's get these dancers in this amazing location and see how we can create a portrait of them to celebrate kind of where they're at in life and the fact that they're in this tight knit community and give them a, a kind of a group portrait uh, of a way to say like, look, this is us now. We don't know where we're gonna be in X amount of years, but uh, what does it look like? And we also did, you know, this is a very still moment from that night, but we did all sorts of scenes around the piano where they were actually like all grouped around and doing a sing along and then they were dancing in the middle. And so, it, and then we did individual portraits of everyone. So there was this whole series that came out of it, but this was the initial kind of the big scene that was gonna say, here's the space, here's what it looks like. Let's showcase everyone as much the as we can. The space is stunning. Yeah. Um, so it was another one that had more of a loose framework going in because they were studying for finals. And so I guess it was before prom because they, I remember very much that there was this time constraint where they had to be in and out because they had tests to take the next day. So uh, I was like, all right, well, let's just get them in there and we'll figure it out. And, you know, having done so many of these, uh, I, I knew we just needed to kind of accomplish these kind of tasks to make sure everyone is seen and, and visually represented in a way that they're happy with. So uh, I'm really stoked that we got to make this because I've been wanting to shoot in this space for a long time. And just having the history of uh, shooting Sydney for 10 years at this point, I think uh, was amazing. And are you shooting from like 20 feet in the air? Yeah, generally a lot of those wide scenes, uh, I'll raise the camera up about uh, between 12 and 15 feet high to, it's easier to give separation between everyone. Whereas the lower you go, people start to overlap a little bit more. So, um, and if you're seeing these, you know, vertical lines of the interior, especially it's easier to keep them straight if you raise up to the level uh, of like a midway point to where the architecture isn't gonna get too skewed. Um, so this is a really great place to bring in uh, my final and favorite image of yours, Ryan uh, Bacon, that, you know, we're talking about a little bit of levity in this crazy, crazy moment. So let's talk about Bacon, this amazing and um, super striking little fella here. Um, <laughs> tell me a little bit about Bacon, please, and about this shot. What did we decide? I forget what this kind of uh, breed is called. Oh, he's a, um, he's a bull terrier. Bull terrier, right. So I only know bull terriers from Spuds McKenzie, and that dates me uh, pretty heavily from <laughs> anyone younger than, I guess, 40. But in the 80s, there was <laughs> these beer commercials with a dog like that, uh, unrelated to this image. But I can't help but think of those commercials when I look. Uh-oh. Oh, my gosh, again. Yeah. Anyways. Okay. Um, we could probably, if, if it's going to be an issue, we could just unshare the screen and maybe that'll fix it. I don't know. I'm going to stop sharing the screen. What's that? Yeah. They, they've seen, uh, bacon. No, maybe you okay. can just, um, just unshare it. Yeah. So, um, there here we go. We're back. All right. <laughs> wow. Um, everyone, the most... Hi. Exciting stuff. <laughs> oh yeah, Bacon was, uh, I was doing a really simple editorial assignment for that restaurant bar, I forget, I think it's called Tenants of the Trees um, that my friend designed and the interior was beautiful. So I was like, you know, I'd love to shoot this for you. And Bacon was the best thing that happened from going into that because the owners were, you know, they were fine. I shot their portrait, but uh, bacon's going to be the only thing that surpasses all the rest of that experience. And my friend Jared Frank designed that interior and the, you know, the, everything from the bench and the ground to the, 
I think the art that was on the wall and kind of the weathered wall itself, it, it was already kind of set up. And I knew going in that even though I don't shoot interiors and I don't do a lot of editorial, to be honest, uh, I knew his aesthetic was going to be something that I could work with. And then Bacon was just like the cherry on top. It was amazing that the owners had this beautiful dog and we could just place him right on the bench there. And he was a willful participant. Uh, you know, I think we shot like three frames and he jumped off. But uh, I think uh, I'll, I'll never forget good old Bacon. You got that in three very frames? Good boy. Yeah, well, you know, dogs don't generally sit for long. Uh, yeah, that's any... impressive. I, <laughs> I, I love the really deep rounds of that photo. That's 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 great. Yeah, I can't believe I think, you got that in three shots, man. Yeah, I mean, it maybe have been five, somewhere around there, but like, it just worked out that his tones were so in line with that place. But maybe, yeah. that, maybe that's not that's accurate. Impre- you know? That's great. That's yeah, great. give yourself some credit, man. That was a beautiful photo. Thank you. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, I don't know if I did that in, in LA, but like that place, I think, is still open. Uh, maybe it, we can go in there and check it out because I know half of it is like exposed patio, and maybe there you can go see that little scene. But uh, maybe they can still there. I don't know. <laughs> Um, I think that that is a great place to stop with the formal aspect of this. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to chime in. Ryan, before we get started with that, though, I did have a question from somebody who wanted to know what kind of equipment you're using and how, you know, the more technical aspect of, um, of shooting these things, if you're interested in sharing that aspect, unless it's a, like a, a, a secret, in which case. No, no, there's nothing secretive about it. I'm happy to go, but, you know, the problem is, is I can talk about that stuff forever. And uh, I don't know, I would encourage whoever reached out to you, they can email me directly and I'll get into the nitty gritty because I think the majority of people, it, it becomes very boring very quickly when I talk about uh, different lighting setups and shutter speeds and tethering and all this nonsense that isn't really necessary to be honest. So you can make these scenes uh, without all that but I'm happy to go into those details for people who want to know. I really love that movement. What was that thing when people were going around with their phones and doing videos uh, into these tableaus and they're like at Thanksgiving with their family and they just had everyone hold oh, stuff? Oh, uh, it, was, it was some sort of like, um, it was like they some sort of been... Twitter challenge where everybody is supposed to be frozen. Yeah. Um, and, and there so was a specific cool. song. I don't remember what it was challenge? called. Is it a mannequin, mannequin challenge? Mannequin challenge. Thank yeah. you. Those were amazing because it showed that you don't need all of that stuff to do it. And, and some of those were so effective and, and just beautiful to look at that anyone can go make these with their phone. But, you know, if you want to go through the nonsense of having all this really particular gear, then yes, uh, reach out to me <laughs> and I'm happy to walk you through it. I've got kind of a, a basic question for you is um, what do you think of uh, the uh, camera phone, like the advancement in camera phones and how close, how close do you think they're getting to like professional photography? Obviously there, there are, there's nothing replacing, you know, professional cameras, but uh, uh, I, you know, how close are, are they getting? No, that's what I'm, that's what I'm getting at. I think they're already replaced. I, there are reasons to use the other thing, but I don't think it's necessary. Uh, I shot a whole Motorola campaign on their phone and part of the guidelines were we had to do it in one frame and uh, there was no compositing. And so it, it kind of proved that you can, it's all really more imagination than it is technical stuff. So- Can you do, can you do that even for like live uh, stuff too? Like- is it the same thing like uh, frame per frame you you get pretty close like the average person kind kind of can't you know yeah it depends what your output is if you're just going to put it on instagram then most people aren't going to be able to tell the difference you know when we start printing these six feet wide in the gallery that's where uh the technology is not quite there uh when you walk up to a print that large 
you're gonna see a huge difference between a medium format camera and a phone. But if the print is eight by 10, let's say, or if it's on your Instagram, you probably won't see it. So, uh, and that's changing every day. It's rapidly becoming a whole new ball game. So I think it, people mostly just need to worry about having interesting stories to tell than the the gear the lighting i mean that stuff's fun and it's nice to be able to control things to really bring about a specific vision but uh, i don't think it's always the most impactful part of an image yeah that makes sense thank you i'm just checking through my um my chat questions here I think we covered them. Um, does anybody want to say anything else? Um, otherwise, I'm going to let you all go and have your dinners or or more drinks, maybe. Uh, whatever, <laughs> whatever works for you. Rose. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, thank you all so much for joining us, and Ryan, thank you for sitting down with us. It was such a pleasure to chat with you, um, as always. And um, now we all have a really super cool memory about being. Um, Zoom bombed. <laughs> and, um, I'm not going to get over it tonight. Maybe, maybe in a couple days. <laughs> but um, Part of the past. crazy thing. It out. What about I know. what about the banana? What about the banana? Uh, like that's duct taped to the wall in that museum. What about it? Like what? What do you? What do you think about it? You know, I, isn't it I just really... isn't it kind of like a, a you know. Like that's that's what modern art is nowadays, you know. I, I to me the the best part about that was the guy who pulled it off and ate it. Uh, <laughs> that was amazing. That was art right there. That's yeah, that is. We, can we sell uh, just him? He comes to your house and just on repeat eats a banana. Like that would. I, I, I want to see, him eat, I wanna see him eat the Mona Lisa. <laughs> you bet we can. I mean, the Mona Lisa maybe not, but um, yes, that was. That's definitely something art. That's that's actually a really interesting question, and maybe for another day that you raise. But um, once we talk about art, or we put something like you know, for instance, my phone, and I, I can hold this up and go, "This is artwork." You know, once I call it that, technically speaking, from a very um, you know philosophical art world point of view, this is art now, and there's no way that you can argue against it. So it's it's a really interesting. Um, conversation to have a really interesting way to um, to talk about it because essentially you could say that this Zoom, you know, we had this um, this really. I great just want to know how many calories are in the Mona Lisa, you know. Well, that's a good question because she uh, she's really old, so maybe a lot. I would. I have a question. <laughs> Absolutely. Would definitely. Uh, you might you might hear my dog trying to wheeze because he wants my dinner, but um. I actually, looking at your work, Ryan, as you're aware, um, there there seems to be almost be a sort of dialogue with painting. I was wondering if, and I, I came into the talk a little bit late, unfortunately, so maybe you've already touched on this, but I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to uh, any influences you have around narrative or historical painting and with your photography work. I think Alex addressed that best. Uh, I, I wish I had a better response in terms of my uh, education in art history, but I think it's mostly been disseminated through generations of uh, derivation. Is that uh, how this, you know, I, I can yeah, only point yeah. toward, Appropriation, derivation, yeah. yeah. I can only point towards me watching movies as a kid, and I think all those directors were ripping off that type of Renaissance era stuff that Alex had pointed out earlier, but no, I, I, I didn't have a, a huge history of studying that and, and using it as an influence, but there's no denying that it's directly uh, impacting all of this, uh, not just the lighting, but the actions and, and the tableau itself is a thing that existed well before photography was even invented. So uh, I'm aware of that and I feel a bit ashamed at my kind of overall knowledge of it, but uh, I'm overly educated. I would say um, <laughs> I, I, don't I will say to that point. 
I will say to that point though, um, if you drop your email in the chat, you can send it to me privately. Um, I will send you, I've been recording this um, whole thing. So I can send you a copy of this when we do get it uploaded to YouTube and stuff and uh, you have not missed out on anything. So I'd like to touch on the uh, the directors that you mentioned, Ryan. If I don't know if you've had an opportunity to talk about those yet. Again, I'm sorry for coming in late with so many questions, but yeah. um, I, I, I don't know if you've talked about them, but I would love to hear about them because I do think there is a super interesting sort of, I don't want to say provenance, but almost around both painting and photography and dialogue, but specifically film as a sort of moving painting. So I, I would love to hear you talk about, I don't know, the things you like there if you're up for it. Yeah, you know, we touched on Gremlins a little bit earlier, and I think uh, Joe Dante and, and Steven Spielberg obviously Back to the Future, all these kind of way over the top in a time when the 80s were making these ridiculous movies. Uh, and I was like eight years old and that was everything to me. Uh, I think that stuff was permanently burned in my brain. Uh, look at the Burbs, uh, look at uh, Karate Kid, anything that has a lot of uh, amazing cinematography. There's a lot of 80s, uh, movies that, you know, if I kind of parsed them out, I think subconsciously have seeped into all this. And uh, it's just, that stuff exists to this day, but your biggest impressions are made, right? When you're in that age where you're just like, you have no idea. Goonies is another one that comes to example. Like you're so wowed by this mystery world that can't exist and but you want you can to definitely be... see goonies in that pond image in the in the, yeah. pond, the farm pond image for sure <laughs> have a good night everybody thank have you